Good afternoon. I'm Carol Christ. I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this presentation by uh, Stephen Coslin. And Stephen Coslin is the founding dean of the Minerva Project, which is one of the boldest and um, most interesting projects currently in higher education. I'll tell you a little bit about Stephen's background. Uh, he is a Californian. He went to UCLA as an undergraduate, then to Stanford as a graduate student, so a native son, and uh, then went east and was at both uh, Johns Hopkins and Harvard for some time. He is a psychologist and neuroscientist whose research specialty before moving to the Minerva Project is mental imaging, and he is very distinguished in his, um, in his world of research. He then he came back to the West Coast after being at Harvard for some time and serving as Dean of the Social Sciences there to serve as the director of the, um, the uh, Stanford Behavioral Sciences Research Institute. And now he has taken on this new project uh, joint with the Keck University of uh, the Minerva Project, and he's going to, the Minerva Project is currently in its second year, and he's going to tell us about his experience, and I'm delighted that you're here to share this with us. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the talk has four parts. Uh, with any luck, I'll have it done in 50 minutes. We're gonna talk about what we teach and why, how we teach, how we use technology, and where we live and learn. So let's start with what we teach and why. Uh, what we teach, we think of as practical knowledge for the 21st century. So I'll be saying more about what we mean by that. But before defining and talking about it in an academic way, I thought I'd start with a demonstration. Actually have you get involved in a demonstration, which I think will really drive home what it is we're trying to do here. So here's a moral dilemma. There's actually two versions of this. So here's version one. I'd like you to simulate this. A train is hurtling down a track towards five people who are tied up and unable to move. There is a fat man standing on a trap door on a bridge above the train tracks. If the door opens, he would crash down onto the tracks, stopping the train. You are at the train's central command station a mile away, watching this unfold on live video. There is a button right by your hand that will open the trap door. If you push that button, the man would die, but five other people would live. Okay, would you push the button? Can you please raise your hand if you would? Okay, now here's a second version. A train hurtling down a track towards five people who are tied up and unable to move. There is a fat man standing on a bridge above the train tracks. You are standing right next to the fat man. If you push him with your hands, he would crash down on the tracks, stopping the train. The man would die, but five other people would live. Would you push the man? Can you raise your hand, please? OK, so when this is done carefully, I, I, I gave this to um, two sessions of Model UN in New York, 2,500 kids in each of these sessions. And it was, it was like fruit flies. I mean, it, the phenomenon was incredibly dramatic in that you could literally see the proportions that they find in the lab. Um, it's usually about two-thirds of people will push the button. So here it looked like maybe half. And then about one-third will push with the hands. Any sense as to why, by the way? Why do you think there's this difference? Disconnected from the actual practice. So if you have them push with a stick, it makes no difference whatsoever. Okay. 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 So why would that matter? You're on the right track, I think. Why would that matter? Would it feel different? So when you, when you, Josh Green, a former colleague of mine, has done these experiments where he's had them in the scanner, the brain scanner. And what he shows is that there are two systems in the brain that are activated in these scenarios. One is involved in emotion and one is involved in logic. So the logical one is dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It's uh, like there. It's an area involved in decision making and planning, a lot of sort of sequential stuff, setting up actions. Um, that area 
is very strongly activated in the first version. We are thinking about pushing the button and two thirds of the people generally will respond that they would do it. The second area is actually the amygdala, which is under the cortex, under the surface. It's involved in strong emotions. A lot of people think it's about fear. It is about fear, but not just fear. Strong emotions in general. And what Josh's team showed was these two areas feed together into a third area in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is involved in integration of the two. So the important thing here is that you've got an emotional reaction, which is like a reflex. You can't turn it off. But that logic area can override it when the two areas come together and they're integrated. So logic can override emotion. You do not have to fall prey to your first reaction. Why is this important? You can be principled. So why did those of you in that first case want to push the button? Save five people? Utilitarian thinking? Could you raise your hand if that was the way you were thinking about it? Okay. Well, there's a completely different way to think about it, which is what does it do for the rule of law, for the society at large, if we start allowing special cases where we can kill people? So you start thinking about that way. Okay, so the trick is you've got to build up a set of principles. Okay, they're self-consistent as much as possible. Why? So other people can trust you. They can predict what you're going to do. You can trust yourself. So many, many places teach these are called trolley car problems. But at Minerva, we use these results as a way to structure a set of lessons on ethical thinking. We say, OK, you're going to, you're human. You've got a brain, human brain. You're going to feel this emotional reaction. Sometimes it's going to be the right thing. Sometimes it's not. It's going to be a life project. You're not going to discover right away how to come up with a set of principles that are self-consistent. You're going to need to look in lots of places. So for example, religion, a culture, a philosophy. There are lots of places you can get the principles. It's up to them to construct a moral compass. We're not going to do that for them. We're going to structure it in a way that's going to help them do this. This is practical knowledge. So understanding how we make moral decisions is the first step towards making better moral decisions. We now know a lot about how the brain gives rise to reasoning, learning, memory, comprehension, other mental abilities. This knowledge should be used systematically in education. And we are doing that at Minerva in multiple ways. The facts about the brain have proven especially useful in teaching a particular kind of knowledge, which we call practical knowledge. Practical knowledge is knowledge people can use to help achieve their goals, such as in moral decision making. Kurt Lewin said in the 40s, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. That's what we mean by practical knowledge. What we don't mean is it's not pre-professional. It's not vocational. It is broad, preparing students for jobs that don't even exist yet. So let me be more specific. So let me focus on the specific kinds of practical knowledge that we've been teaching at Minerva. So we started with a set of goals. because you could, There's a huge range of possible kinds of practical knowledge, just huge. So we needed to focus in. So what we decided to do is take a step back and ask, what do we want our students to be able to do after they graduated? And then based on those goals, we backed into what we teach. So the goals are not particularly surprising. The first is leadership. So many mission statements at universities say they want their students to become leaders. Who hires fresh BAs to be leaders? <coughs> so from our perspective, you have to understand leadership. You have to know when it's appropriate for you to step in. But even more important, you have to know when it's appropriate to work with other people who are the leaders and how to work effectively as part of a team. Similarly, innovation. Everybody says they want to teach creativity, but you don't want people to constantly innovate. Often there are perfectly good, very good solutions that are off the shelf. You should make use of them, best practices. So we teach something called gap analysis, where the first thing you do is identify whether there's actually a gap where there's no tried and true solution already available. You don't want to innovate constantly. We also teach them to be broad. So we want them to be adaptable, as I said, to be able to succeed at jobs that don't even exist yet. So a set of generative cognitive tools. And finally, we believe the future is increasingly international. So we want our students to have a, sense of, a global sensibility, to be global citizens. So 
looked at the empirical literatures on leadership and on creativity. There's actually quite large literature. So I focused on meta-analyses. And also interviewed a bunch of employers as to what they were looking for in the kinds of people they wanted to hire. And it turns out there are published surveys of this out there, which agreed very strongly with the people I talked to. Came up with a set of four core competencies that underlie these goals. This is what we want to teach. None of them are surprising. Two of them are personal skills, critical thinking, creative thinking. Two of them are interpersonal skills, effective communication and effective interaction with other people. No one's going to argue with these four core competencies. There was just one problem we ran into when we first started building the curriculum you know, about two years ago. The problem is they're impossible to teach. It's a problem. Anybody got a sense as to why they're impossible to teach? Why, for example, is critical thinking impossible to teach? It's contextual. That, OK, that, that's part of it. Other thoughts? It's about doing. Sorry, about? It's about doing. It's about doing. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Well, here's what we realized. It's not one thing. So if I were to make a claim, let's say critical thinking is impossible to teach, it's a claim, you might try to evaluate that. How might you try to evaluate that? Well, you might try to think of a counterexample where you've seen critical thinking taught. You might think about the assumptions I'm making. You might think about the logic, and so forth. That kind of critical thinking is really different that if I ask you, should you go to Minerva or UC Berkeley? Now you want to maybe set up a payoff matrix. What do you have to gain? What do you have to lose from each of the different choices? And then you want to be very sensitive to the fact that humans are disproportionately sensitive to the prospect of loss. So when you evaluate them, notice there is no overlap in what you teach for the kind of critical thinking involved in comparing two alternatives, making a decision, and evaluating claims. Similarly, evaluating inferences. Very different set of kinds of knowledge that's involved. So it turns out that until we'd figured out a taxonomy of aspects of each of these, and it's true not just for critical thinking, all four of them, it's not one thing, they're, they're separate things, we couldn't get anywhere. So core competencies cannot not be taught directly. They're not one thing. They're each heterogeneous categories. So here are examples. I gave you two of them. We've actually used three for critical thinking. Creative thinking involves solving problems, facilitating discovery, effective communication, obviously writing clearly, presenting, um, uh, effective interaction, negotiating, leading, working on teams, and so forth. There are various aspects. I'm not going to give you a complete taxonomy. Each of those, in turn, led to a set of very specific learning objectives. So each aspect of a core competency is carried out by two kinds of learning objectives that, that we focused on. Habits of mind and foundational concepts. So this is what we teach. So we started with the goals, the four big goals. Those led us to these four competencies, just four where it worked out. Those in turn have led us to a set of aspects. And finally, only after we've got them refined as to what the goal of teaching is, have we come up with the things we're actually going to teach, which are habits of mind and foundational concepts. Let me tell you about them. So the learning objectives, habits of mind, well, it's a habit, so it's going to become automatic. It's of mind. It's um, something you do mentally. So it's a cognitive skill that becomes automatic. So what we'd like is if you hear a claim, we'd like you to immediately try to think of a counterexample. Immediately, just a reflex, a kind of cognitive reflex. That's a habit of mind. So we've defined um, a set of these. So here are some examples. So the use of plausibility checks for claims. So if you're doing, this includes things, by the way, like if you're using a calculator, just be aware of what the order of magnitude is. So if it's off by a factor of 10, you're kind of aware of it. Um, but also, just in general, if someone makes a claim, start thinking about things like counterexample, what the assumptions are, and so forth. Uh, identifying audiences and tailoring the messages accordingly. That should become a reflex. Know who you're talking to. Uh, considering who stands to lose uh, in decision making. You should be sensitive to that. So these are habits of mind. The other kind of learning objective we have, we call foundational concepts. 
So this is broader. Habit of mind, situation comes up, it immediately comes to mind. Foundational concepts are broader and they require deliberation. So it's fundamental knowledge that promotes broadly adaptive behavior. So here are examples, cost-benefit analyses, actually set it up, think it through. Uh, best alternatives, that's plural, to negotiated agreement. So you go into negotiation, you want this BATNA in your back pocket, that's what they teach you at Harvard Business School, but we want at least two. So if the negotiation fails, depending on how it failed, you'll have different alternatives. You have to think about it, you have to be sensitive to what's going on. Principles of multimodal perception that affect design. So I happen to have written two books on how to use principles of perception and comprehension in PowerPoint presentations. Turns out when I design a PowerPoint presentation, I have to go over it several times afterwards to apply the principles. They're not intuitive, they're not habits of mind. They really require deliberation. Same thing's true of writing in general. And you all must have noticed this. You have to edit your own work afterwards. Um, so Minerva has designed a four-year undergraduate education to develop key habits of mind and foundational concepts intentionally. There are 115 of them uh, that we introduced in the first year. How do we introduce them? They're abstract. They're things like I've just been describing. They have to be introduced in concrete contexts. So the first year we taught, last year, we used content that was convenient for introducing certain habits of mind and financial concepts. The students gave us feedback that it felt that it was sort of jumping around a bit. They wanted some kind of continuity. They wanted threads through. So it turns out I, I hired a guy named Josh Faust who had published a paper where he wrote a computer program that went into course catalogs all over the world and pulled out every question. So every case where there's a period here and a question mark there, he pulled out the string. And he created this cloud indicating what the big questions were in course catalogs all over the world. Pretty cool. So I said, great, let's use big questions. But let's put some criteria on them. One is they have to be in existing course catalogs. We need some principal way of picking them, so they're going to be relevant. Uh, but they're relevant to at least three countries, because we're internationally oriented, so we don't want somebody who's provincial. We want them to be really hard, things you have to really struggle with. They can't be answered with certainty. Why? Because we want the struggle of seeking answers to provide insights into the world as it is. So here are examples. Why do people commit crimes? How can we feed the world? Can machines think? Who owns information? Can war be avoided? So we have units that usually last about a month where there's a single big question and a set of these habits of mind and foundational concepts that are introduced in that context. Okay, and, and they're all within some domain of um, inquiry, like uh, um, uh, uh, descriptive statistics or, or something like that. Um, so they're introduced in the first year, and I've been focusing on the first year, in four courses. So the first is called Formal Analyses, and it focuses on critical thinking. So each of the courses is focused on one of those major core competencies. But that's not the only place those competencies show up. It's the focus of that course. So in this course, they, it's the focus is on critical thinking. Uh, they get deep training in advanced logic, uh, rational thought. So there's a distinction between the two. Rational thought has a lot to do with content. Logic's all about form. Uh, statistics, a lot of Bayesian statistics in particular. Computational thinking, they all learn Python. Uh, and formal systems. Uh, empirical analyses, so focus on creative thinking. So they do acquiring the ability to use scientific method to frame problems, test hypotheses, and engage in informed conjecture. Uh, multimodal communications, which is focused on effective communication. So they learn uh, reading and writing, which turns out to be very hard. Most of our students, by the way, are not American. Over three quarters are international. English is not their native language, but it doesn't matter because even the ones with native language have a lot to go in terms of a lot, a lot of room for growing in terms of reading and writing. Visual communication, uh, public speech, speaking, uh, roles of art and music in communication. And finally, probably the most creative course we do is complex systems. So this is focused on effective interactions. It's actually a, an applied complex systems course. So the, the first month is pretty standard. They learn about ants, they learn about flocks of birds, the standard sort of complex systems phenomena, where they learn about how simple agents interacting um, with feedback loops can give rise to emergent properties, and so forth. 
then we take all that and apply it to complex systems humans are in, like economic systems. We function in multiple overlapping complex systems or legal systems, medical systems. So they understand the idea of multiple causality. So we take, we did uh, homelessness in San Francisco as a final project last year, where the idea was um, try to understand it and think about what an interven intervention might be. Well, it doesn't have one cause, it's a complex system. It's got multiple causes. The effects interact in complicated ways via feedback loops and so forth, very often hard to predict. Um, and if you have an intervention, it often will have unexpected consequences. So the, the idea is these students are not gonna buy what a politician tells them if they say they have a simple way to cure homelessness. There isn't a simple way, it's a complex system. Um, we use the same lens to have them learn about group, group project collaboration, negotiation, leadership, and formal debate. So we've, we're teaching this in very different ways than other places have done. This is the Minerva Learning Pyramid. So it's, it's driven by the goals for our students, for our graduates. We want them to understand leadership, innovation, to be broad thinkers and global citizens. Um, we've analyzed what it takes to achieve those goals, and this is an emerging ongoing living project. The first year there were 129 of these Habits of Mind foundational concepts. It's now 115, some have been consolidated, some were eliminated and new ones were added, and this will continue. But the four core competencies will not change. Thinking critically, thinking creatively, communicating effectively, interacting effectively. You can't be a good leader unless you can do all those. You can't be an effective innovator who gets other people to go along with you unless you can do all of those. They, they underlie the goals. And finally, the learning objectives in every single course is driven by one of these, by the way, every single session of a course. Habits of mind, things that you can do automatically without needing to think about it, with enough practice, in the right context, and foundational concepts, which require deliberation. So in the early 20th century, there were great books programs. Anybody know what happened to those? St. John's University. It's still, yeah, there are a few that still exist, but most of them are gone. You know why? We're fully representative. Yeah. Who decides which books and how many should there be? So it just, there, there was, it started off a bunch of dead white men, a limited number, and then it started being added and pretty soon got diffused. What we're doing is something that's very different. You couldn't have done it till the 21st century. We're calling it a great cognitive tools program. So these habits of mind and foundational concepts, which underlie those four core competencies, which are generative, which we hope will help the students succeed both professionally and personally after they graduate. These are the great cognitive tools. They're empirically driven as much as possible. So let me tell you now about how we teach, which is also very empirically driven. So what I've been doing so far is a very un-Minerva thing. We don't lecture at Minerva. So a flipped classroom, as most of you probably know, is where you take the homework and you have that done in class, and you take the lecture and you have that done before class, right? Well, we've, we've gone one step further. We take both the homework and the lecture and do that before class. In class, what they do is they do active learning to learn how to apply this information so they can think creatively, think critically, and so forth, to the extent where it starts becoming intuitive. So it, it's all about using the information. It's all about making it practical knowledge. So lectures are a great way to teach you can lecture to 10,000 people as easily as 10, but they're a terrible way to learn. And I can send you a lot of literature on that if you're interested. So what we've done is we've taken advantage of the science of learning and teach only interactive seminars, a max of 19 students. It's all activity-based learning. Uh, it's extremely empirically motivated. There are 16 principles that we've applied. So let me give you some examples. I'm gonna actually have you do some of these exercises so you get some intuitions about what these principles are like. So there are, there are three principles that I'm gonna focus on of the 16. The first is depth of processing. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to pair up. So you're a pair, please. You're a pair. You're a pair, so everybody find a pair. So I need you all to pair up. There used to be somebody on your left, somebody on your right. If, if you are an odd person out, um, look for the person behind you or in front of you. Okay, can you raise your hand if you're not in a pair? Can you raise your hand up if you're not in a pair? All right, everybody's in a pair, great. Okay, here's what I'd like you to do. So the left person of each pair is gonna decide whether each word in the following list, I'm gonna show you a list, 
names a living thing or not. So tree is a living thing versus rock is not. Is that clear what the judgment is? You do this in your head silently. So thank you. The person on the right of each pair should decide whether each word as printed, the way it looks, has a taller letter at the beginning than at the end. So see house here? H is taller than E. So this will be yes. OK, see mouse? No. They're the same height. This will be no. And look at most. The T is actually taller than the M. That would also be no. Any questions about what your job is? Just to find left and right is from our perspective. Yes, from your perspective. Thank you. So your perspective. OK, is everybody ready for this task? Shh. OK. Shh. OK, please raise your hand after you've gone through the entire list, and I will know when you're done. OK, I think everybody's done. Now, recall as many words as you can from the list. OK, shh. You have 20 seconds. Go for it. Shh to yourself, honor code here. OK, so please look at the list again and count how many words you got, you correctly recalled, you got right. OK, now compare the number you got correct with the number your partner got correct. OK, finally, shh, shh, finally, I want you to raise your hand. So if raise your hand if the person on the left, raise both, both pair, everybody in the pair, raise your hand if the person on the left to judge living, non-living, got more correct than the person on the right. Can you raise your hands up, please? OK, high up, high up, high up. OK, look around the room. OK, can you raise your hand if the person on the right got more correct? So you can see there's a huge effect here. Many, many more people got it correct if they judged living, non-living, if they judged the heights. Why? It's because judging whether a word names a living thing requires deeper processing. You have to get more information out. To think of whether it's living or not, you probably haven't memorized yet yeah, it's living, non-living. You've got to think, does it move? You know, is it, is it a plant? I know plants are living. Reason a little bit. You have to do more processing than judging surface properties. So surface properties are just given to you, the heights of the letters. So the more deeply you process the information, the more likely you are to remember it. So what does it say about seminars? Ask them questions. Get them involved. They've got to be engaged. They're not going to remember it otherwise. They're not going to understand it deeply. Sitting there in lectures is very bad. There's some lovely meta-analyses on that. I'm dying to send you. Send me a note and I'll send it to you. Chunking. Here's another one of these principles. The next slide shows a series of letters. Now I'm telling you, try to memorize as many as you can. Ready? In order. OK. How many letters can you recall? Please try to remember them. OK. Uh, can you raise your hand if you recall more than nine letters? OK. Uh, can you raise your hand if you recall more than nine letters and you notice the groupings? Look around. Can you raise your hand if you got more than nine letters and you didn't notice the groupings? Look around. Thank you. You're a very good audience. I love this. Uh, all right. Now, everybody, look for three-letter acronyms of famous organizations. Look for three-letter acronyms of famous organizations. How many letters you got now? Raise your hand if you got more than nine letters. It's called chunking. So you use the associations you have in memory to organize it. We can organize a, and hold about four chunks. But the trick is each of those can have four. And it can have even more than that. There's a guy that had a wonderful experiment. It was done at Carnegie Mellon. They, um, they brought in this undergraduate. Uh, and they said, will you commit to coming to the lab three to five days a week for the next year and a half? He said, OK. He said, fine. Have a seat. I'm going to read you random digits, random digits, one every five sec, one every second, one every second. So we start with a simple set. Uh, the number three. Can you repeat it back? 
Three, got it. All right, now let's have two. Six, four, got that? Got it. They keep going up, adding additional random digits. He does about, I think it was seven the first day, which is about normal. They keep bringing him back. By the end of the time, he could do 79. Random digits, random digits, one every second. How do he do it? He was a long distance runner, he's a marathon runner. And what he started doing was converting the digits into times of particular segments of races he had run, and then organizing them into a big marathon. And then he learned some other tricks he could do too. Last day, they switch him to letters. How many think he got right? <laughs> Seven. It's very content specific, some of these techniques for organizing. So it's incredibly powerful. If you teach people how to organize things effectively, it's amazingly but it, effective, but it's got to be specific for the content. So last piece, last of the principles I want to show you. Uh, repeatedly recalling information strengthens the memory. It's called the generation effect. Uh, a variant of this is called the test effect, by the way. If you design a good test, you'll actually learn it better if you design a good test. Um, so remember that list that I showed you? I mean, how could you forget um, at this point? How, if instead of showing you the list, I could have shown you definitions like small green amphibian that makes ribbit sound. You know what that is? Frog. And so forth. The act of digging out the information and generating it is the kind of depth of processing. You're going to remember it very well. Okay. So why did I tell you this? A good way to recall something is to explain it to somebody else. So could you go back to your partner and explain the three principles? Your partner should recall and check for accuracy. OK, can you please do that? What are the three principles I just went through? Um, uh, explain them, please, and check for accuracy. OK. OK, so here were the three principles. So the three principles are depth of processing. What is depth of processing? I'm having a memory problem. Depth of processing, please. What is it? Shh. Depth of processing. What's depth of processing? Yeah, you got to pay attention to it. The more you think about it, basically, the more you think it through, you pay attention. OK, great. Chunking. Yeah, how many roughly can people hold at once? Three. It's three or four, actually. But three is safer. You're right about that. Um, and you can break them down. It's very hierarchical. And finally, the generation effect. What was that about? Just having to recall the information. Have to produce it. You're going to remember it. So these are three of the 16. Um, I've written a little paper on this, if anybody's interested. Why are these principles relevant to Minerva? That should be very obvious. Our seminars are designed to lead students to think through material and make and use appropriate associations. So we have a matrix we call the fully active learning matrix, which has got a set of activities that the class does as a whole. And then the rows are things that everybody else who's not participating right now is doing in the background. So we try to keep everybody engaged as much of the time as possible. So we have interactive live seminars, activity-based learning, Empirically motivated 16 principles. All right, how do we use technology? Every one of our courses is taught over the computer in a seminar. They sometimes sit together, but they all have the computer on them. They're all active learning. So every class is driven by a learning objective. One of those habits of mine are foundational concepts. Every single one has got an objective. They're capped at 18 students. We use fully active learning. We try to engage everybody as much of the time as possible. Um, they're face-to-face -face synchronous seminars as a professor, PhDs, all. Uh, fully active, not semi-active. We want everybody doing something. It's one of our mantras when we develop courses. What's everybody else doing? Why do we do this? It's enhanced teaching. Um, the, the platform, which I'm going to show you some demos of right now, uh, has built into it a set of tools that make it easy to do this kind of active learning. And it actually helps students learn, in part because we record everything. And every single session is scored using rubrics according to the habit of mind or foundational concept for that day and every other one they've had previously. So the faculty goes through the recording, tags each comment the student made with a rubric score and an explanation, a little comment. A very quick feedback, principle of learning. Very quick feedback. It's, it's called deliberate practice. You, you need to show people where they're getting things not quite right and help them to minimize the difference. So let me orient you to the platform. This is, um, so across the top, there is an, there's a little um, video thumbnail of each student, which is now moving in real time. 
This particular version is seen from the professor's point of view and has the decision support tool turned on. So what this is about is um, students all start off green and after an allotted time, and there's various ways to compute that, uh, it's, it turns yellow, which means the student is starting to approach the amount where mm, maybe they're talking enough. And red means they've talked over the allotted time. Now the point is not for the professor not to call on people who are red. The point is to alert them for the greens. Why do we do this? Because there's a literature showing that female students are called on less than male students, even by female faculty. That's what alerted us to doing this in the first place. But it turned out to have been a very good idea for other reasons. Because we're grading them based on their comments, we need to get as much participation as possible in there. So this is a decision support tool. You don't have to follow it, but it helps you know where things are. And it's amazing how unintuitive this is, by the way, how much people have talked. Um, the main part of the platform can be configured in many, many different ways. Here there are four students up. You can have eight total. You can have a, you'll see a simulation running here or a graphic or music running in the background. This is a PDF file. It's fully integrated with Google Docs. You can have a document the entire class can work on, any of this. All right, so let me show you some excerpts from last year's class. In this session today, we're going to focus on spoken communication. You'll have to articulate a thesis and support it within the context of a debate. So this is Dan Levitin. At the time, he was our Dean of Arts and Humanities. Uh, he's now moved over to social sciences. He's uh, author of the book, This Is Your Brain on Music, which many of you may have seen. Uh, Judith uh, Brown, who's kind enough to join us today, is our new uh, Dean of Arts and Humanities, um, who is um, very well versed in all of the humanities. So what you see here is the hab this particular class, he was, he was introducing two of them that are related. They're both habits of mind. That's what the little h consists of. There's a paragraph that explains, unpacks what the, uh, the actual habit of minds are. Um, that's how classes start. So we use rubrics for everything, for grading. So the rubrics typically are five points. One means they show no evidence of understanding the habit of mind a foundational concept. Five is they're able to use it in creative ways, what's called far transfer. They're actually able to take the information, apply it in a very different context. And then there's steps in between. So what the students see all the habits of mind and foundational concepts and get the rubrics uh, in advance. So they, they know what we're going for. We're teaching for this. It's what we want them to learn. So we gave them the rubric that they were going to be evaluated on and asked them to evaluate Thucydides, ancient Greek philosopher, as his ability to use that habit of mind. So they did a poll. Oh. So using, using the rubric, what score would you give Thucydides? So what you see here is these are students who voted to give him a four, which is pretty good. One student gave him a five, which is kind of amazing. Nobody gave him a one. Thucydides was doing pretty good. And you can see we've identified which students voted which way up here to make it easier for the professor to call them. So what we often do is we'll have them vote or take a poll and then pick a random student and say, tell us why you gave Thucydides a four. Call one student. Well, actually, in our group, we gave him two grades. Uh, one was considered to be in the standards of today's uh, historical measurements, and uh, one was considered in the standards of uh, his time. So we do a lot of computer simulations uh, in breakout groups. So here is breakout group central. This is all from the professor's point of view, by the way. So here we've divided it into four breakout groups. Um, you can set them up in advance. So here are the students in the breakout groups. Uh, or on the spot, uh, randomly. The, the program is being set up to use various criteria to do it on the spot. That's one of the things we're developing. What they're doing here is this is a road, and there are little cars that go along it, and they're adjusting the code to discover when you get bunches up of traffic. So you can see um, each group is working independently. So you can see stuff starting to happen as they get their code up and running. Down over there over here, and they have, some of them have graphical tools up that are running. And then afterwards, we can import this into the class as a whole, ask them what's going on. We do a lot of student discussion. So what, what are your arguments? Please. We're okay. like, we're like pff, we can't wait to hear them. So we do a lot of voting with follow-up. Iga, what do you think about uh, why the answer yeah. is no here? At uh, first, I chose yes, but it turned to be no. Because I saw the standards on the website shows the differences between the scholarly and the popular articles. So it's very flexible where things are. So one of the issues was um, we didn't want to embarrass people on the platform, but it's very public. It, it's unlike in a lecture hall where you're looking at someone's back of their head. 
you know, someone defined distance learning as the second row back. Everyone's looking at each other. So it's, it's very exposed. So we set it up so you can ask a question and pass it under the table to the professor, who can then decide whether it makes sense or not and when to introduce it. So no one's embarrassed. So this turned out to be very effective. Can we ever treat something that quickly changes over time as discrete, like weight? What do you think? A lot of debates. I would like to answer this question. Now, uh, let me know, I do not know how much it's going to cost to do DNA testing for every case. But what I do know is it's going to cost a lot of the taxpayers' money for putting an innocent man in jail when he was not wrongly convicted. So for 10, 20 years, your tax money is going to be going paying for someone in jail who did not commit a crime. So one of the reasons I like that particular segment, after about a week, they stop interacting with the computer. They're interacting with each other. So you can see that in some of the earlier ones. There, there's a lot of emotion being transmitted via this platform. The other thing I should mention is when they're debating, all the other students have rubrics and are using it to grade the debaters. And at some point, we stop and we ask one of the other students who's not up debating to what their grade was and why. So we want everybody to be engaged. Why? Depth of processing. You saw it already. This is one of the most famous pieces of music in Western culture. How does Beethoven use this iconic four-note rhythmic and melodic motif? Roja, how did you hear him using the motif? He used it like all the time. First is um, the starting notes, and then the da 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 da, just like everywhere. Here's some you can't I'd like do you to hit your check mark when you art. feel that the tension is being resolved. So don't hit it at the beginning if there hasn't been any tension built up. But hit the X when you're feeling tension and hit the check mark when you're feeling resolution. Here's the X, there's the check mark. Watch up here on the top. You can stop this at any point and say, Ego, why are you feeling it building up when other people seem to be feeling it's resolving a little bit and make a discussion out of it? So class ending. And unfortunately, we're out of time. So I'm going to end class here with the usual post-class survey. And I hope that all of you take an opportunity between now and next Monday to get out into San Francisco and have a good time and relax a little bit. And I look forward to seeing you next Monday. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. So they all live together. We've got a residence hall in Knob Hill. There's another one on Market Street. Uh, they, as we'll talk about in a second, they take their classes on the computer, but they study together, do co-curriculars and extracurriculars, and location-based assignments in the city. We treat the city as a kind of campus. We try to take advantage of local resources. So 100% small seminars, motivated by science learning, very student-centered. So let me finish. So finally, oops, where we live and learn. So they live together. Uh, the first year they live in San Francisco, but after the first year, they go to seven different cities, one a semester, every four months. And there, there's a rationale as to how we've selected them and what we're doing in those cities. I don't have time to go into it. Um, so these are the cities. So we were serious about global citizenship. It also, at the end of the first year, their grades are provisional. The grades on how well they did, the rubric-based grades on the habits of mind and foundation concepts, they are adjusted up or down every semester thereafter based on how well they use that information subsequently. So we're interested in FAR transfer, having them use the information in a novel context. It's one of the reasons we're having them write blogs when they travel. And we're actually giving them feedback on their blogs on their ability to use the information we taught them that first year. So why are we doing this moving around the world? We have extracurricular activities, co-curricular, location-based assignments. So extracurricular are optional. These are student clubs. Uh, pursuit of passions and interests just for the love of it. Co-curricular are encouraged, but not required. Uh, there were things like they went to, uh, to an advertising agency last year and saw how the Get Milk campaign was put together. And in fact, started pointing out things they learned in class about how to use music, for example, to change mood 
which they weren't doing as effectively apparently as they could have according to what the students learned in class, which resulted in some internships that summer. It's very good. Uh, Location-based assignments, which are required. So this is uh, part of actually what we're doing for WASC to get enough seat time. We actually have them go into the city and use what they've learned in class in an applied context. It's part of the curriculum, ties directly into the habits of mind and foundational concepts, H and C or habit and concept. Uh, the city is an extension of the classroom, broad general context. Let me give you some examples. Uh, one time there was a huge matrix of these. It's been very simple. So they might uh, be interested in homelessness, something where our office is on mid-market. We're very concerned with this. So they might help serve meals at local homeless shelters. Students would do that. Co-curricular, meet with Cecil Williams, a pastor at um, Glide Church, who's been instrumental in helping the homeless to learn about the history of homelessness in San Francisco. We actually had them um, meet with a homelessness committee at the mayor's office last year, but that was part of a location-based assignment where they were working on solutions to homelessness, taking into account facts about complex systems. So this was actually a project in their complex systems course, trying to think about how that lens would inform a way to think about homelessness. So let me summarize. Uh, we're student-centered in the sense that our only metric of success is how well our students do. That's our only metric of success. We have various ways of measuring that, starting in class with the rubrics, but also after they get out during the summers and internships, feedback from the employers, if we have a feedback loop, which is another way we're improving our curriculum, and then of course once they start graduating. So the goals are understand leadership, know when to be a leader, how to work well with others, innovation, broad thinking, global citizenship, four big core competencies that underlie those. And then finally, we have these 115 habits of mind and foundational concepts. This is all the first year. After the first year, they, they declare a major. Um, there were five colleges, business, arts and humanities, computational sciences, natural sciences, social sciences. Each of those has at least nine concentrations they can select from. Uh, in their third year, they start a capstone project that lasts two years. They get a mentor who's not a Minerva, who's an expert in the area, plus a faculty advisor. And then last year, they do senior tutorials where they list four topics they're interested in. We match each student with two other students and a professor. The first two weeks, they design the syllabus, and then they take the seminar. And it's very outward looking. So there's a trajectory, starts very much on this found foundation of what they do in the first year. It's a very serious general education program which is designed to achieve very specific ends after they graduate. Uh, so David Brooks said, so far, most of the talk about online education has been on technology and lectures, but the important challenge is technology and seminars. So far, the discussion is mostly about technical knowledge, but the future of the universities is in practical knowledge. It is totally independently of us, by the way. We were happy to see it. So Minerva, it's about practical knowledge for the 21st century. Thank you very much for your interest.